Zwei Group invites all AEC industry leaders to the 2024 AEC Small Business and Entrepreneurship Forum, the premier event for small firms in the AEC sector. Experience innovative strategies and insights on May 21st, crafted by Zweig Group's industry experts. Engage in keynotes and interactive sessions focused on recruitment, retention, and business growth. Join Zwei Group for this unique networking opportunity and take your business to new heights. Secure your spot today and be part of the AEC industry's future. Visit ZweigGroup.com for more information. The Zwei Group team looks forward to welcoming you. Welcome to the Zweig Letter Podcast, putting architectural, engineering, planning, and environmental consulting advice and guidance in your ear. Zweig Group's team of experts have spent more than three decades elevating the industry by helping AEP and environmental consulting firms thrive. And these podcasts deliver invaluable management, industry, client, marketing, and HR advice directly to you, free of charge. The Zweig Letter Podcasts, elevating the design industry one episode at a time. Hey folks, and welcome to another episode of the Zweig Letter Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Wilburn, and uh, I'm excited to be here today with Vatsal Shaw. Vatsal is with Mott McDonald. Uh, out of New Jersey, uh, it's actually got two fel- two Jersey boys on the uh, on the podcast today, and uh, I'm excited to connect with that. So he he connected with Zwei Group a while back, and we he and I had a really great conversation last month, and we talked about uh, as soon as we had some time, we wanted to get him on the podcast just to find out what's happening there in the tri-state area, but but also just what's ha- what's happening with Mott McDonald and what what Botsell is seeing out in the marketplace with everything that's happening with COVID-19 and the coronavirus pandemic. So uh, without further ado, Vatsal Shah, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks for having me today. Absolutely. Absolutely. So why don't you tell our audience a little bit about yourself, your superhero origin story, and uh, a little bit about Mott McDonald for those that are not familiar with your firm. Sure. So um like I mentioned before, Jersey boy, born and raised. I went to a local university here, NJIT, in Newark, New Jersey. I happened to share that same alma mater with our CEO, as well as a bunch of other uh, managers and executives across our firm. We're Jersey strong, and uh, we're glad to be so. Uh, I finished my engineering degree in 2008 from NJIT with the Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering. Uh, went for additional punishment in 2009 for a master's while working full-time at Mott, and then stayed at Mott working full-time and went for my PhD at night again at NJIT. So it's been a really good experience staying in Jersey, working in the local area, but also having a company like Mott McDonald that supported my career uh, through and through. And it's been interesting. I mean, Mott McDonald is a consulting engineering firm. We have um, offices across the U.S. I believe it's about 70 offices across the U.S., as well as internationally, too. Our, our company, Mott McDonald, was based out of U.K. It grew into Asia. Uh, it grew into uh, the rest of the world over the last hundred years or so. So it's a big consulting firm. It does everything from civil engineering uh, to energy to pipelines, transportation, anything related to the um, the general infrastructure sector. Yeah, and it's I, you know it's funny we've been talking a lot about infrastructure lately. And um, are are you guys bullish on infrastructure work continuing and not declining? And even in in light of everything that's going on right now. I think we are. I mean, at the end of the day, once the COVID restrictions lift, people will still have to get around, have to go about their day to day, still need to drink water. You know, so that need will always be there for society. So, you know, whether we're bullish in the next couple of weeks, maybe less so uh, next couple of months into years, it's an absolute necessity. You may have yeah. seen the American Society of Civil Engineers report card. And across the U.S., uh, we've had a pretty low rating from our report card for infrastructure. So it's a need oh, all across man. the U.S. 
Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. And and I was kind of that was more of a softball throw to you because I mean I know the answer to it, but I, I just think it's right. always good to hear from somebody that's in the throes of it. But you're right. I mean, I mean, what would I do without water and roads? I mean, I'd be right. I'd be in a world of hurt. So uh those are things that are really important. Um, why don't you kind of just share with us how you guys have been as a firm of your size, over two thousand plus people, how you guys have weathered the storm during this COVID. 19 coronavirus um, pandemic. I know when we last spoke, I was telling you how in Bergen County, where which is where I'm from, uh, not not terribly far from you, but there was so mm-hmm. there was such a high incidence of of uh, coronavirus cases there, and, and right. a lot of people. I have friends that had friends that died, and so it's pretty serious. But how have you guys been able to manage that uh, and manage all of your your people and still get work done? I think early on, Mott was uh, one of the earlier adopters on cloud technology. So I know years ago, our IT services was rolling out uh, the ability to work through things like, you know, Bentley's platforms, project wise, through SharePoint from Microsoft. It caused growing pains to project managers like myself when we were adopting all these different technologies, whether it's online or do local network work. Uh, but I think that investment paid off substantially. So, you know, even though most people have been remote working and it's kind of new to them, remote working has been kind of the backbone for us for a long time. It's almost usual practice for us at this point. That's great for all the office-based work. We also have a lot of staff out in the field. And I think we've just adapted to the times. You know, I think when we have travel restrictions, like uh, the inability to travel using planes, trains, and and mass transportation, we've had our staff now driving to sites directly in separate cars. Uh, Luckily, the roads have been a little bit lighter, so you can get staff around easier with a little more stress, a little more safely too, with less traffic. But they've they've adapted to the times by adapting remote working and some safer practices being out in the field. Yeah, you told me, I remember you mentioning you had to send some folks down, I think, to South Carolina maybe, uh, or and yeah. you had to negotiate with a hotel to get a place for them to stay. I yeah. mean, you, these are issues that we we take for granted because it's just so easy for us to pull out our Hilton card or or Hyatt yeah. or whatever and, and just book book a room somewhere, but it's not as simple anymore. And then on top of all that, you still have the concerns. It, it may be one thing, you might find a hotel room, but you have other concerns because you have to make sure that your employees feel safe and right. feel comfortable and and feel like, hey, these folks at Mott McDonald are looking out for me, even though I'm out on the road, you know, doing whatever I need to do. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think what we found, uh, we laugh about it now, but when we had staff down in Texas or South Carolina, you know, we're coming from hotspot states like New York City and New Jersey. You hear these things all the time in the news, number of cases increased substantially in the Northeast. So we're also careful and cautious. We don't want to make our employees a statistic. And vice versa, we want to make the community we're going into a statistic as well by bringing something down there that may not be, uh, might not be safe. So when we were down in South Carolina more recently, our staff had to go down and speak to the hotel before they got down there to make sure we had a room. We tried to alleviate some concerns by finding a room block that's in the corner of an area and uh, actually pay for more frequent cleaning just so they had a peace of mind. And so our staff also felt and understood that we are looking after their safety, which is really, uh, which is really interesting because we don't take those things lightly, take them for granted now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, as you were saying that I'm thinking, I, I, I you know, I travel a lot, a lot, a lot. And uh, right. when I was at Zweig, I mean, probably a hundred thousand miles a year. And I, I used to never let the, um, the, the housekeeping even come into my place. If I was going to be there for a couple of days, I, I just mm-hmm. like to kind of keep it the way that I would, would, would ever keep it. Now it's just, it's a whole different story. I've, I've kind of gone on the whole other side of the spectrum now where I'm like, I want everything cleaned every hour on yeah. the hour. And, you know, I want to make sure that everything is good. But that, that I think that's just it's part of the what we're calling the new norm uh, mm-hmm. of how things are. Um, right. Tell tell the, tell me about uh, and I'd love to just kind of pick your brain and maybe some of the people listening could pick up some ideas. But since you say you guys have been doing remote work for some time, so so you're not this is not new to you that you guys are kind of old hat. What right. have, have you done to keep the culture going at Mott McDonald uh, from a remote work perspective. And did you right. find that when this whole thing happened, that, that, that those things that you, those things that you had put in practice previously have kind of right. helped you or have you found that you've, yeah. uh, you've uh, expanded it at all? 
Well, you just opened Pandora's box, Randy. This is my favorite topic to talk about because it's interesting. You want to keep the fabric of a culture moving forward. <laughs> At the same time, I think what we miss the most out of everyone in culture right now is the ability to be in front of someone, to interact with someone, to hear a different voice than your own roommates and your, you know, your family. So we made it a point very early on, even before COVID, if you're remote working, to have two check-ins not just from your manager itself, but from someone else who might be at the same level, the same line. So you don't feel like the person who's talking to you is my manager is just looking at, hey, how's work? Are you moving this thing forward? Do you have any questions? And it becomes a just routine thing that's mechanical every day, every couple of days. You want to make sure that someone else who's not that manager is interacting with them. So there's a sense of community. It's not just an up and down approach. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit sideways too. So it's important for our managers to check in with their staff uh, at least twice per day. We have a check-in at 11 o'clock in the morning at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, to the extent possible. doesn't have to be a long thing. It can be a text message. How are things going? Do you need anything? Is everything all right? And then every other day, we'll have um, other staff, just again, same thing, checking with other groups, see how their work is coming along, if you have any questions. Because what you lose, too, working in a common environment is the chatter behind you. You hear about other projects. You hear about things, oh, I should have considered this in our work. And engineering is collaborative. It's never in a cube. We do one thing and pass to the next person after us. A lot of the assumptions we make, a lot of the designs that we come up with, a lot of the conversations we have have to be carried between person to person, assignment to assignment to complete that project as a whole. It's not just one designer. It's the entire team. So that helps to build some of the organic collaboration, just the conversation, which has been good. And that's day to day. That helps to keep the culture and the activity of our, our projects moving forward. But what I love to do more than anything else is keep the fabric of our uh, personality kind of going along too. So we'll do every Friday on a Zoom meeting, we'll do a happy hour. Sometimes we get two people, sometimes we get five people, 20 people. We had 40 people last time, which is you know fantastic. And we'll throw in some guests. So we'll throw in some people from other divisions. We'll invite a couple of friends just to make it seem more organic. That's what we want to do. When we go out to happy hour, it's not just our group. We have people around us as well. Maybe, maybe we invite friends or invite other teammates to it. So we try to do that as well. We did Hawaiian shirt Friday last week, which is great. Um, we happen to have one year anniversary for someone coming up so we can um, send over some cupcakes to, using Uber Eats to their door. And then we do a little celebration for them for lunch that time. So it's just things that we would normally do in person. We're trying to find a similar or equivalent way of doing it, you know, in a remote working set, uh, standpoint. Yeah, no, I, I, um, I, I love those. Those are those are some great ideas. I, I I would be curious to know. So, with in addition to the check in, how have how has it worked with regard to leadership at Mott McDonald? Kind of keeping in touch with, um, and I won't say the rank and file, but just everybody, yeah. right? Because I, I think that's tough when you have two thousand people. It's right. it's hard to keep in touch with everybody like yeah. that. Agreed. So. Well, we have a very good um, executive board. Our, our CEO, Nick DeNiclo, also NGIT, NG, you know, Jersey grad, um, he does a weekly town hall meeting where it's it's not really Q&A, so to speak, in this sense, but you can type your questions and they'll answer it through the chat, the chat box as they go through. But it gives a sense of we're all in this together. I mean, every week we know on Monday at one o'clock, our CEO is giving us this the state of the practice and the health of our business. And it's not always just rainbows and butterflies. It's you know, Randy, and he gets into the very details. Randy has uh, picked up a project for us and his team completed a project on this date with this little with his client. So he does recognize the rank and file, mm-hmm. the work that we're putting in. But then you also say, you know, our New York City contracts are being uh, slowed down. So there's going to be a, a downturn in work. So as much as we want to portray the positivity, we have to give the reality of it too. You never want to tell your staff, no one will get laid off. You know, I promised you. And then a week down the line, something happens. So he's very honest in the way that we, we manage that situation. And at the same time, our executive team and just my line management, uh, twice a week, they do the same sort of checking with us. They'll come up. Uh, we have a conversation at one o'clock on Tuesdays and Thursdays, you know, middle of the week to go through how things are, how are our staff doing, what do we need to move along the, uh, the work that we have. And is there anything that they can bring forward to us as our champions, the rank and file to the executive team to make sure our voices are heard. So there's a really, really good zipper approach from top, you know, top down and bottom up. Yeah. What, what are you, and I'd be curious to know, what are you guys hearing from clients? Uh, are, are, what are clients, what, what's been your interaction with clients and, and what are you hearing from them in terms of just their sentiment about everything that's going on? And, and again, you have a wide 
box of clients that right. do a lot of different things. So I would imagine that in different verticals and in different markets that, you know, you're going to hear different things, right? There's some people right. that are just like, listen, this is just business as usual. We got to keep doing what we do. But then others are like, I don't know if we're going to be able to continue to do this or. Right. So right. What, what's the, the overall sentiment that you guys are getting? I mean, overall, I, I think the entire consulting engineering um business has probably seen a little bit of a downturn given everything that's been going on. I'm lucky to be in a field of civil engineering called geotechnics, which deals with foundation design and everything needs a foundation. Otherwise it floats or falls down. So we have to be involved in all those different pieces. Um, our energy sector has seen, you know, an uptick in renewables. Our, our staff who've been out in Texas and Florida are working on wind turbines and solar farms. And that actually has seen a boom in growth in the last couple of months. We know we can't seem to keep up with it. Uh, oil and gas has been a little, a little further down. I mean, we know it's been happening with the oil and gas market recently. So with one going up, the other ebbs and flows in the other direction. Uh, at the same time, you do know that a lot of municipalities are trying to trim their budgets because of things that are being shut down and closed, money being reallocated. So we're seeing a lot of the municipal work being put on hold. We have large contracts with city organizations and they're putting the work on hold. But on the flip side, the Department of Transportation is looking to do a lot of rehab work now because no one's on the road. So we see a little bit of ebb and flow in that case. Uh, same thing with water, wastewater. We see that the funding may have decreased slightly, but they know they have to do the work moving forward. So they're doing more of the planning up front today than the construction that they were doing last couple last couple of months. So we're, we're generally seeing a, a you know kind of a positive outlook next couple of months. We have seen an impact in all the different business units that we have, but uh, I think it's I think it's still pretty good moving forward. Yeah. And then how about utilizing your resources just in general? Are you able to, when certain areas kind of slow down, are you able to pivot with some of those folks and transition them into other groups or yep. has that been seamless or did you already have a, play, a pr- plan in place for that? I think just from my opinion, I know that uh, the way I've handled our staff is, <clears throat> you know, we're civil engineers first, so we shouldn't specialize in one thing. Mm-hmm. Sometimes larger firms can become, um, to make processes more efficient, you become almost pigeonholed. You can do one thing very well, but then you can't do other things that well, which makes it difficult to make staff uh, a little more versatile. At smaller firms, sometimes they're better we- uh, better weathered to these storms because that same staff might do the job of four different roles just because of the nature of the work and you have to you know, have different positions along the way. Our firm has been great <clears throat> in that they expose a lot of our staff to different work along the way. So for instance, in our civil engineering work that we do in the geotechnics, the staff that we have don't solely work on oil and gas, but they work on water because it's another pipeline. Sure. They can work on buildings because it's just something uh, in a different field and different area. So I think a lot of our staff have been versatile enough to pick up a new skill. Uh, and that's just resiliency from the human spirit. You know, when things are rough and times are difficult, put to the test, a lot of people are willing to, to try something new, learn something new, and then adapt to it. So a lot of the staff have adapted to this new way of working and just, just new opportunities in the working space. Yeah. And, you know, as they say, I, I, I remember somebody telling me a long time ago that variety adds a spice of life. So <laughs> it's it's kind of nice to to try some different things. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I'd be curious to know what, what are you guys doing from a hiring standpoint right now? If, if you know, and I've been asking everybody this, if, you know, that, you know, it, this industry is hard. It's hard to find good people. Right. I mean, right. If, you, if you could find four of you, you'd probably hire them all because, you know, in a heartbeat. So what, how, how has hiring changed for you guys, given everything that's going on right now, or right. have you, have you just kind of maintained status quo as far as that's concerned? I think from my perspective and the, the group that I manage, um, the need for staff has increased. And as we go into summer months, I mean, we see the weather turning, we see the general consensus that people want to get back to work. So we're seeing an uptick in our backlog right now for the work that I'm doing right now. And, uh, there is a need to hire, before we got into this uh, COVID situation, you know, the marketplace was red hot and uh, it was difficult to find the right staff. And, and we kind of ease off that crunch, but I don't think the need for good talents and good labor is ever going to go away. Uh, the workload that we may have put on pause is still work that had to be done. There wasn't much elective work that was being done beforehand. So whether it was a water uh, system upgrade, it was a new pipeline, it was new infrastructure, uh, it was still planned and still is planned moving forward. So I can see the hiring being a need for us. In the current months, we have put uh, a freeze in the hiring for a little bit, obviously to make sure that the backlog remains consistent. And I think a lot of firms have done that to make sure they have a good snapshot moving forward. They've taken a temporary pause to realign themselves, to make sure that their numbers match up with their hiring, and then we'll take the the right step, the planned step 
of hiring the number of people they'll need moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's obviously got to be a little bit, not so much caution, but just like you said, proper planning to, to make mm-hmm. sure that you don't over, you know, overshoot yourself as far as uh, where you right. need to be, um, where you need to be. And if I can add too, you have to remember that this is a different working environment. So if you bring someone on board, you do want to make sure they're efficient and you have a policy in place. So what we've done in the last couple of weeks is preparing a stay at home policy. So we know for our group alone, if you were to come on board, what sort of things would you go after? Who would you be asking questions to? And how can you navigate around this? Because you're not there to ask your buddy a question and say, hey, where do I find the timesheet? How do I find these sort of things? So I think a lot of companies are taking time to update planning documents too. If we were to change the way we hire and where we work, you know, our, our planning should also incorporate that too. So I'm really glad to see not just our firm, but a lot of the firms making time, having the space with time that we have off to come up with these planning tools. And that's great to see that. Yeah, it is. And, and you know, it, it's like we, none of us can really see what, what's in the future. All we can do is plan properly for how we deal with situations that come up. I, I know that, and this is just kind of an aside to what you're saying, but when you mentioned this, it just brought this to light. We got an email from our children's school and they go to a, a arts academy and um, the, the school basically threw out three different scenarios that could happen in the fall. Because like my kids are out of school for the rest of this year. I mean, so they're, right. they're at home doing school. And but school starts back up in August. And essentially, the principal was like, well, these are the three things that we think could happen. And right. here's how we're going to do it. And, you know, my wife and I, we were looking at it and we said, man, this was really well thought out. And I think really that's all that you can do is, is right. you can, you know, put a plan in place. And then if you have to work that plan, work it and, right. and go from there. Don't, you know, don't because I think two, two firms are just trying to overthink it. And, yeah. uh, you know, they get into this, well, you know, they want to play because, you know, and, and again, no, no, no shade on engineers, but sometimes you guys overthink everything and that's, that's, and right. that's okay. We're that's mechanical. The, exactly. Right. Exactly. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I, I just think that, you know, just having a good plan in place and being able to work that plan um, and be willing to work it to see if it's going to work. Cause you never know if a plan, yeah. I mean, sometimes you have to course correct in mid stroke. And well, what's, what's incredible too, when you see the word planning is before we got into COVID, I feel like this personally, you may, you may feel the same way in your audience may as well, but there was really no mental capacity or time to plan. You know, we were just kind of moving so fast as a society, as a company, as groups, you know, there wasn't much time to sit back and say, we need to take a pause and rethink how we're operating this way. Rethink our business model, rethink, you know, how do we make sure our staff feel healthy at home? How do they make sure they can work in different environments? It almost kind of forced us all to say, you know, you have a little break, let's plan and make sure this is the right direction we want to go. I know, you know, friends and family of my own that have come up with some aha moments in the last couple of weeks just saying, I never really had time to think about this, but this is important to me. And in the same circumstance, we come up with those aha moments of what's important to me. These companies, when they plan, including, you know, Mott and other firms, I'm hopeful they're having aha moments of this is what's important to our firm. We didn't notice it before, but now we're taking some time to realize it and we can, you know, do something in the avenue to move that forward. Yeah, no, you're abs- you're absolutely right, and and I have done nothing but think uh, in these <laughs> in these last two months. I've had nothing but time to think, and nothing but time to read and reflect, and then uh, obviously work. Even even right. in doing these Zoom calls, I mean, I've gotten I was pretty good at Zoom. I thought I was pretty good at Zoom calls before. Now I'm an expert. Uh, because it's a whole different ball game, and you're kind of forced to, um, you know, to be able to iterate on the fly. And I, right. I think that that's really important. So, you know, um, that's all. I wanted to ask you a question because it, it, this is something that that does come up. And you know, you're 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 a young engineer. Um, where where do you see this industry going as a whole? And when I say this industry, I'm talking about the design industry as a whole. I, I think that. Um, I, I always think I always find it interesting when I connect with um, firm leaders and those that are maybe in their 40s or 50s. I mean, mm-hmm. they have a, a, a they have a mindset about what this industry represents. And then I look at and I, I spend a lot of time. I've spent a lot of time lately with younger people, right. like just out of school. 
and they have a, almost a whole nother idea of what this industry represents. And I, and I think it's, it's going to be interesting moving forward, but you're kind of in the middle of that. How right. are you dealing with that? You know, you're a younger guy. There are older, as I like to say, older heads in, in the firm right. that right. have a certain idea about thing, things right. and you have an idea and some of your peers have ideas about things. And how do you reconcile that? And, and what do you say to younger people that might be listening to this podcast that, that are, are trying to navigate the waters. They don't want to upset things, but at the same time, they want to be heard. Right. It's, it's funny you mentioned that because another Pandora's box. I gave a talk to the uh, National American Society of Civil Engineers at a conference on millennials. We call it Generation um, you know, Me to see what we're talking about. And I kind of fall in between that line. I'm in my early 30s, so I, I'm considered a millennial by definition. But I'm considered, um, you know, kind of in the management chain at our, at our company. And from the start, I'll say engineering is a fantastic investment because we'll always need this industry. Um, I think the number of professional engineers, the number of engineers coming out of school continues to be uh, decreasing or staying stagnant to the point where we'll need more uh, work moving forward. We're going to have a brain drain of very good technical staff who are leaving in a few years because mm-hmm. at a lot of firms, you see a, a bulk of senior members who have a lot of knowledge you see a thinning out in the middle and then you see, you know, a growth coming through of the younger staff. Mm-hmm. Your question about, you know, what would younger members think when they're at a firm to make sure their voices are heard, but they're still understanding the reason. And one of the topics that I covered was there's two different sides of the equation. You have the management who are looking for, you know, bottom line, you still have to run a company. How can we operate? And the younger staff who want to feel like they're making a difference in what they do, who want to understand what's going on. Um, you know, they, they want to just, change the way they work. Remember that a lot of younger staff grew up in the Google era. So when we wanted a question, we wanted to answer something, we would go online, we can Google the the question we have, and we'd have so much information that we could synthesize and make our decision based off all the information we have. So we're used to information, we're information craving group. So when we have, you know, to be asked by our our upper management, our staff, hey, you know, you're going to do a project in this manner. For us, we want to know why. We want to know why did that actually happen? Why are we following that manner? What's the end goal? What's the outcome? So we can piece together in our head. It's our minds are working now. Okay, this makes sense. I gather all the information. I'm doing it for this reason, for this purpose, for this client in this manner. You know, we have important decisions to make as a manager. I have a lot of younger staff who might ask me or, or say, this doesn't really make any sense to me. You know, why can't we work from home? What's the reason for it? And I, I want to be able to work from home because it's more comfortable to me. Well, you know, the reason we work from home is you can get things done quicker. They're, uh, you know, it's easier for commute time. It might uh, fit your, your needs, but working in the office environment, you're missing things like the interaction really can't collaborate in this way. Um, as a manager, I do walk around. I want to make sure I can see what people are working on. So there's a question I can ask you organically. I can also make sure that we're working forward and we're, we're getting our projects done. So if things were to fall apart or if we miss a deadline, I kind of had the ability to, to intervene along that way. So by sharing the reason why with their younger staff, hey, here's the reason why it's important to me here's why we're doing it this way. I really have found that it's filled the need for a lot of younger staff to understand the process. And if I'm missing something as a manager and for them, if they think that they're not being heard to explain why they have a need to feel like, you know, the, the question that they have um, might have a, a valid input to the project, or to the organization or to the structure of how they're doing things. Yeah, no, that, yeah, you make perfectly good sense with that. Uh, I'm curious to know, do you think, just given everything that we're doing now and how we're remote working and how it's working out for firms, um, will there be a modification? Do you think, and I'm not, I mean, I'm not asking you to write anything in stone, but do you think <laughs> that Mott McDonald will have right. a modification about what remote work looks like moving forward? Right. Just cause I mean, we could be dealing with this situation for another 12 months easily. Right. I mean, right. we could have a, right. a second flare up in the fall and all of a sudden we're right back here in our garages or in your bedroom or whatever. Right. Right. So um, well, I'll pull up my crystal ball and uh, I'm looking <laughs> to the future here, but you know, I, I think I thought this for before COVID came through, but looking into the future, remote working is all about trust. Yeah. You know, if you can, if you can operate remotely and you trust your staff and they can get the work done, <laughs> Um, then it should be, it should be more seamless. I know when I first started working about 13, 14 years ago, I was with some of the more gray hair engineers and it was important to be in the seat, be in the seat at eight o'clock and go home at five o'clock. Cause that's what it meant getting things done. Um, but now it is, we measure it by productivity. And I noticed a lot of younger staff 
are looking for, you know, it may not take me eight hours to do this task. I can do it in six hours, mm-hmm. but why can't I do it in the way that I get this project done? Here's the end goal. Uh, and we can move on and work from home. So I think moving forward, I've developed some trust in my staff. I've developed trust in my ability to manage and also in the processes that I've had, which I'll still refine. But once that trusted process is there, I can see remote working becoming a more critical piece of what we do because it allows people to have more time and mental space, whether it's at home, uh, you know, more quiet time with their family to think more critically about the work that they're doing, but still also build some skills in their end to learn how to communicate with me. And that's a big piece for engineers that we don't always get taught in school is communication. I've noticed that this has been a little bit more interesting learning how to communicate because as a manager, I, I learned that some people can make it better over text message and some are better over the phone, some are better over Skype and person to person. So you're just building trust along the way. And if that trust can be built, then I think that the remote working is here to stay for some time. Yeah, I, I, I love what you just said about understanding how different people communicate. It's, it's um, one of the things that I do with Zui Group is a PM training. We also do a leadership training. And one of the big things that we talk about is communication. And everybody communicates differently. I, I communicate differently than you might communicate differently than somebody that just joined your firm that's a year out of school might communicate. And it's incumbent upon us, us meaning collectively as leaders, as people that are managing other people to understand what's the best method of communication in the same way that we connect with our clients, right? And say, hey, right. how would, because right. you know, you may have clients that say, listen, that's all, text me anytime. And that literally means anytime. Mm-hmm. Whereas you have some other clients who are like, listen, I only want to hear from you via email. This is, you know, and I'm going to respond to you in this way. I think it's important for us not to force on others what our preferred method is, but to understand what other people's preferred methods are for communication, right. for effective communication. And even if it's somebody below you that reports to you, it's still incumbent upon you as a leader to manage them properly and understand what works. Don't just say my way or the highway, because that's a mistake right. that we've seen in this industry for years. Uh, but it's it's been slowly changing. And I think those managers that are most successful those leaders that are most successful are the ones that ask the question, how would you like me to communicate with you? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, and I'll, I'll share that the biggest lesson I've learned through the whole COVID experience has been communication. You know, when, when you're working with your staff, you develop somewhat of a good repertoire with them. You develop a good understanding with them. And what I've noticed is I've gotten to deeper levels of understanding with them just by communicating the right way with them through this process, whether it's via phone or email or how frequent I communicate with them that I've never had before in the past. And the secret sauce of why we have backlog moving forward, you know, two, three, four months and increasing backlog at a time like this is learning the same thing about our clients. A lot of times we think of a transaction, you know, between a client and ourselves as purely transactional. But now calling them more often, some like to talk about their families and some don't. We know this about our clients sometimes. Some like to talk about work and some don't. Some like email, short blasts, and some like long phone calls. But I'm also taking this time right now as a successful you know, manager and leader to understand who likes to communicate in what ways. So when we come out of this thing, we're even stronger than we were before, and we know how to work with our clients and our staff much better. And that's been the best experience I've had in the last eight, eight weeks is learning how to communicate better. Yeah. And, and there's always room for improvement in that area. And, and, you know, the direct correlation with communication, of course, is active listening, right? Because yep. if, you, if, you, if you aren't listening to what people are saying to you, Um, you're going to miss it every time. It's the reason why scope creep is a problem when working with clients. Mm -hmm. It's the reason why project management teams have internal fissures or issues because um, PMs or senior PMs don't effectively listen to the people that that are reporting to them on those particular teams. And, you know, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of things that are sometimes lost in translation because active listening is not being put into practice on a regular basis. Right. Yeah, and there's a great Zweig letter. I mean, I've been a kind of a stalker for a while reading all the articles, but there was a great uh, Zweig letter article a couple of weeks back about communication, and it hit the nail on its head. And when I was reading, I said, wow, you know, the last five weeks of success has boiled down to this, this exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. I appreciate all the content that's been available. It just pointed to the same thing. Communication is needed. 
Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, and I think this Wag letter has done, I mean, between Mark's Wag and all of the thousands of articles that he's written and just the content that comes out of this Wag letter over the last three decades for this industry, it's it's just, you know, you can get an MBA in how to run a design firm just by reading that on a regular <laughs> basis. So, I mean, it definitely yeah. is. I appreciate that those comments that that is certainly um, well received for sure. Um, well, listen, as we wrap up, uh, I, I was curious to know, and I had a couple of other just small questions I wanted to ask you. As a graduate of NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology, for those of you that don't know, it's the real deal. Uh, it's the MIT of New Jersey. <laughs> Let's write it that way. That's and, right. Uh, yeah, so that's right. So you got to say with a little pride. And uh, I'm curious to know, um, as an alumni, do you make it a point to to be known on that campus with the professors and others, especially since that's such fertile ground to find mm-hmm. great talent. Because that's this is the one thing yeah. that I see a lot of hiring managers miss out on is going back to their own stomping ground, their old stomping grounds, reconnecting with their professors and making sure that they have a, a beeline to the yeah. great talent that's graduating. So you, you asked the right question, but I'm an NJIT alumni uh, on steroids. I am the vice president of our alumni association. I've been adjunct professor for the last five years. I have three degrees from there. So very biased approach. I love being an alumni. I love giving back. But you said what's absolutely true. As an adjunct, you know, I teach a senior level course and a graduate level course here. And all of our staff come from that university to the extent possible because you get 13 working sessions of three hours a piece to see how they think, how they write, how they analyze, how they communicate. That is the best interview you can get. And you can cherry pick the best of the best before they even go out to the market. Yeah. For those that don't have the capacity to be an alumni, even going on campus and interacting with a, a team there, you know, being a senior design leader, going in to give a colloquia, the students that come to you after the class and colloquia, these, these seminars, are the ones that are proactive. They're the ones that want to learn more. And, and those that have that curiosity always tend to be on the higher side of people that you want to hire. You know, that the, the people that have the desire to be treating this as a career more than a job. Um, so for those that don't go back, you're right. It's fertile ground to go picking for, for the best of the best. Um, hopefully people don't listen to this podcast too often to take that secret away from me. But it's a great <laughs> place to go back in and, and, and try to give back a little bit to find those talent. Yeah, no, I I love that. No, what's meant for you is for you. I don't think anybody is going to take that away. And and you can take (laughs) NJIT out of the equation and put any other insert any other uh, school in that equation and, you know, start going from there. And I I think you need to folks need to be more active about the opportunities that exist, uh, even at your old alma maters. I mean, there's just so much, so much, it's just fertile ground. So uh, I yeah. certainly encourage you to take, take advantage of it. So last couple of questions, what was the, what's the last book that you have read or are reading that has really impacted you? Oh boy. Okay. Uh, I just finished the book this past weekend. It was given to me by our librarian, Gerard Murphy. It's called Monday Morning Mentoring. Oh, um, I want to say the person's name is David Cotterell, I think might be his name. Yes. But uh, he, he goes through 10 lessons that he learned from mentor when the guy was going through a rut in his life. You know, he was going through, um, the, he put more effort, he was successful in his early career. He put more effort and more effort. He was seeing less and less results along the way. Mm-hmm. And he could see that he was becoming disillusioned, maybe just misaligned from the things that gave him success in the past. And a lot of it boiled down to communication, taking on responsibility, and uh, and just understanding the general uh, what my team needs and how can I help them versus what I need uh, alone because everything is a success with the team. And before that, I had the uh, the secrets of reversing burnout, which is on my uh, yeah. coffee stand right here. Another Zweig Litter uh, book, and that was a fantastic book, eighty pages long. Um, you know, high performers are not immune to experiencing things like that, and burnout doesn't have to be emotional or mental or physical. Burnout could just be, I love doing this. What's next for me? And that yeah. book was really enlightening because it came at a really interesting time in my life where I wanted to make sure I was aligned to make sure I, I took the jump to the next step while still being energized. Yeah, no, that's, that, that is, um, that is a, a really good book. And, and I think that um, more design professionals could benefit from, from reading that book specifically. And uh, you know, it, it is a huge um, it, it's, it's an itch issue that we see in our industry there, there have been a lot of studies done, and, and Zweig has done a lot of surveys um, that has found that you know there is some 
dissatisfaction within the ranks, right? You know, of people that have not found true fulfillment. And some of it is directly correlated to just the fact that they're burning the candle on both ends and they're not taking time for themselves. All they do is eat, sleep and drink engineering or eat, sleep and drink architecture. And, you know, all work and no play makes Jack or Jane a dull person. And right. uh, you've got to be able to really take care of yourself. So, uh, man, I love that. I, I appreciate uh, I appreciate you you coming on and kind of sharing your nuggets of wisdom and just just giving us a glimpse into the world of Mott McDonald and, and what you guys are able to do and especially how you're still holding it out there in the tri-state area with all that is going on. And, and that was probably one of the hardest hit areas of our country. So, um, you know, I, I just I certainly want to applaud all that you're doing, Vatsal, with you and your team there. And uh, if people want to reach out to you and just connect with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, best way is email. This is okay. usually the best. Um, it's Vatsal, V-A-T-S-A-L dot Shaw, S-H-A-H at Mott Mac, M-O-T-T-M-A-C dot com. Yeah. And we we will put that in the show notes for everybody. We'll put all of that as well as a, a LinkedIn profile for Vatsal. Don't go recruiting him though. Just, just reach out to them. Just reach out to him if you have questions. And um, certainly we, we appreciate you uh, being part of this podcast and sharing your perspective on things. And uh, we wish you nothing but continued success in, in all that you do, uh, Vatsal. And um, uh, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, there you have it, folks. Another episode of the Zweig Letter podcast. It was great to have Vatsal on to kind of talk about all the things that are happening right now, even with the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. And, and we know that this will pass, right? But we're in the middle of it. So we might as well talk about it. We might as well think about ways that we can overcome it. What are the little things that we can continue to work on? And Vatsal missed, uh, mentioned so much on this episode. You should go back and listen to it. We'll make sure that we get the transcript, the show notes, all that information will be uh, on the zweigletter.com website and uh, you'll be able to get more information about it. I also want to encourage you, please, if you don't already subscribe to the Zweig Letter, you need to get a free subscription to the Zweig Letter. It will come into your inbox as P, as a PDF every Monday morning. Uh, you'll get a great article from Mark Zweig, who is the chairman of Zweig Group. You'll get great articles from Chad Kleinens and Jamie Claire, Jamie Claire Kaiser and all the other advisors at Zweig Group. I mean, Zweig Group's goal is uh, the, the existence to, to help elevate the industry as a whole, period, end of story. Uh, no matter who you are, no matter what you're doing, no matter what your role is in your organization, Zwei Group is here uh, to el help elevate you in the in the process. So we hope you enjoyed this particular episode. Again, check us out at zweigroup.com. And also you can check us out at thezweigletter.com. And um, we look forward to, to hearing from you. So if you have any questions, you can always email me, rwilburn at zweigroup.com. And uh, we'll have another episode for you in the very near future. That's all I have for you today. You guys go out there and continue to build and design and create amazing things. Peace. <laughs>